Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. I know most of you. Um, I am Mustafa Akhlaqa, Professor of History here at Georgetown. And I have the distinct pleasure today of introducing our speaker, Professor Eugen Yanukta. Professor Yanukta is Associate Professor of History at the University of Richmond. He is the author of several fascinating articles that explore the war experiences of rank and file soldiers in the Middle East during the First World War. His book on this topic will appear soon under the title, Healing the Nation, Prisoners of War, Medicine and Nationalism in Turkey, 1914 mm -hmm. to 1939. Living as we do in a country that has been at war for over 10 years now with US soldiers in the Middle East, Professor Yannickdar's talk today, following on the heels of Veterans Day or Armistice Day, sheds light on what can happen to soldiers once they step off the battlefield. War, of course, never ends on Armistice Day, psychologically, physically, or politically. The title of Professor Yannickdar's talk today is Little Mehmet in the Ottoman Great War, Wartime Nervous Breakdown, <coughs> and the Politics of Medical Interpretation. Eugene? Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa, uh, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I want to casually talk about this rather than uh, read something except uh, a few occasions when I have uh, quotations that I want to be more accurate about those rather than going uh, from memory. And uh, I should tell you up front as well that uh, we or I necessarily have to tell you the story from the doctor's perspective. Uh, since the soldiers in general, the literacy rate during this time in the Ottoman Empire was about uh, 5 to 8 percent. And only a few officers left behind uh, memoirs. And some of them do observe actually certain psychological changes among their comrades, whether during wartime or uh, if they became prisoners of war uh, during their captivity. Obviously, I should add that uh, soldiers who suffered such problems seem to have left none of these things uh, behind. Even though in these memoirs, we can also see some certain psychological changes, but minor ones, uh, of these officers who, who left behind uh, memoirs. So uh, today, then, I want to start talking about uh, first the early war years, then the uh, war itself, and briefly into the interwar period to see how the medical interpretation changed and made certain kinds of policies possible and what, what were the reasons for these changes. So before I begin with the main part of my talk, uh, I want to introduce um, few of the doctors that I will mention by name. These are not all of them, but these are some of the most important ones that I think, at least in my text, if I were to mention their names, uh, will come up. Uh, the biggest picture is Mahsar Osman, uh, who in 1935 took the last name of Usman, specialist, uh, appropriately last name, I think. He was sort of like the most well-known uh, of the um, psychiatrists, and sometimes I call them neuropsychiatrists because some are neurologists, some are psychiatrists. And the, the dividing line between the two uh, sciences uh, uh, were not that clear-cut. And to the right on top of the spot, I think Karen Gokai, who was, all these are actually students of Masa Osman. Uh, some are a lot more independent from their former professor than, than others were. Uh, I think Karen Gokai was always very close to uh, Masa Osman, he's one of the youngest ones, but I think politically speaking, he was a lot more, um, should we say, uh, took advantage of the situation and eventually became mayor of Istanbul and governor and uh, minister of, of health in the 1930s, later 1930s. So I, I, I can add that perhaps more than any of the others, he became more involved in politics. Shukur Hazem, Iksan Shukur, and Nazem Shakir. Uh, they were all military doctors during World War I, but some turned to civilian service, including Masa Osman, who resigned his commission. Uh, the only one who stayed in the military was Nazem Shakir, who was, by, by my uh, count, I would say, of these most seriously minded 
uh, of, of these doctors in the sense that he, he tended to be a lot more conservative in the kinds of pronouncements he made about soldiers. He was more accurate with numbers rather than saying, uh, I'm sure you know some of you encounter who work with uh, Turkish documents, uh, rather than saying pekchok or a lot or many, he tended to actually give numbers. Uh, so this is always always good, of course. So next slide, uh, I also want to introduce a few more people here. I'll only mention uh, in passing, uh, especially Marcel Osman, but all of the neuro neuropsychiatrists here study with the German giant of psychiatry, Emil Kripplin, who discovered dementia pertox, which came to be known as schizophrenia later on and a few other diseases. Uh, of course, Charcot, the French neurologist, comes up as well. He's the one, uh, uh, I'm going to mention the term as diagnosis, hysteria, a little bit later on. He masculinized hysteria in the sense that up until that time, hysteria was known only as a woman's disease. But he diagnosed the disease among uh, big burly laborers, mine workers, railroad workers, etc. And therefore, hysteria lost its feet connection should we say. Um, and his student, a rebellious one at that, uh, Joseph Babinski, uh, challenged some of the uh, per, you know, uh, discoveries or, or teachings of Charcot about hysteria. And in fact, during the war years, he became perhaps, should we say, a lot more militarist, and as, almost as much as the, some of the German neuropsychiatrists, and invented some, invented some tactics. That, would, that was designed basically to cure uh, soldiers, French soldiers suffering from various uh, forms of war neurosis or, or also shell shock into health by basically uh, using uh, electroconvulsive therapy. So with that in mind, I'll leave this on and, and get into this uh, talk itself. But when the war starts in 1914, uh, Ottomans enter a few months late uh, in October 1914. Uh, they mobilized uh, something just over 3 million men. Of those, by the end of the war, half a million deserted. 200 to 250,000 of them became prisoners of war, and so many hundreds of thousands of them died uh, during the war. What we don't know about the Ottoman war experience is something that was actually a very common occurrence in the European armies, where hundreds of thousands of soldiers in the German army, in the British, in the French army, actually, within a few months of the war, started to break down psychologically. Uh, German army suffered something like 600,000 men uh, who were not able to go on fighting. Uh, some of these were cured relatively quickly, so actual number of permanently disabled uh, psychologically was in the end about 200,000, so about one third of that number of uh, uh, 600,000. Uh, England was a little bit lower than that, and French numbers are all over the place, uh, basically because it depends on whether the doctors view these conditions as legitimate disorders or not. In most cases, they did not. So when the war started, and these men started to break down in, in high numbers, doctors were baffled. They didn't know how to interpret it. At first, they thought it was because the exploding shells, even though they didn't injure these men, uh, by because of the air pressure, because of the sound wave, actually shook the brains inside their skulls and created micro lesions. So they call this condition shell shock. Uh, but after a few months, uh, after some of these soldiers died, uh, autopsies were performed and they saw no micro lesions at all. Then they had to look for other explanations. Mm -hmm. And all along, some German doctors had been saying that this was uh, what the soldiers were displaying. The symptoms were basically uh, symptoms of hysteria, mutism, uh, uh, functional disorders of sight, hearing, and, 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 and uh, speaking, so soldiers could not see, they could not hear, they could not talk, they would shake, they would, uh, they would not be able to stand up or walk, so they had problems of gait as well. Uh, all these were basically called shell shock, which would soon be outlawed as a, as a diagnosis, a diagnosis category, because doctors decided and military command decided 
there was nothing related to war in these conditions. Uh, it was simply that developed in the psyches of these men. So this is what the German doctors were saying. This was hysteria. It was no different than peacetime hysteria. And therefore, instead of calling it um, shell shock or the German version of it, uh, with various terms, they decided to call it at first war neurosis, then simply they switched to hysteria. Uh, in England, there was actually a diagnostic difference. Uh, British soldiers, uh, enlisted men were diagnosed with hysteria, and officers being different and the class difference were diagnosed even if they displayed the same symptoms with neurasthenia, which was an American invention of the 19th century for overworked uh, wealthy classes, uh, so they would get a change of air and go, go to vacation places, basically. Uh, so Ottomans became involved. Uh, by 1915, uh, the numbers of German shell shock soldiers, and I will use the term sort of interchangeably here and there, uh, or war neurotics, had become so high that the German high command asked the doctors to put a stop to this problem, cure these soldiers, send them back to the front. So Masar Osman, who had been in touch with his teacher, Emil Kriglin, but he also traveled to Berlin, he attended a couple of uh, conferences, medical conferences. I came back from those, he wrote a couple of articles, uh, one directly on, on a report on, on, on a conference on shell shock. Uh, another one was an article he wrote that he titled, Are Turks Degenerate? Question mark. Now if you read this article, He's actually mostly talking about other issues. Everything actually from bailing to polygamy to uh, soldiers fighting in distant fronts, bringing in diseases, etc. But curiously, in a relatively short section, he also brings up what he witnessed or heard about in Europe, that thousands of European soldiers are breaking down, showing these uh, hysterical symptoms. Question comes up. Lucky for me, he asks, does, does, did this or does this happen in the Ottoman Empire as well? And he says, well, yes, but no. Yes, because yes, he witnessed them, but he says the numbers of these men in the Ottoman Empire is less than 1% of what the Europeans are reporting. And explanation, explanation is, well, he gives three main ones. One, uh, and even though Obviously, he's an Ottoman. He frequently uses the word Turk, of course. He says Turks are not as degenerate as the, uh, the French and the Hungarians. He leaves out the Germans out of this equation. Uh, another reason is that uh, he says uh, our soldiers are content with their lives. They don't seek luxury. They don't try to escape situations that they find difficult. Whereas European soldiers do, and when they, when they cannot escape, these kinds of things show themselves in these hysterical reactions. Um, uh, so, contentedness and, and uh, lack of uh, high degrees of degeneracy, I guess, goes to explain why Ottomans did not suffer in such high rates. But he doesn't deny it at all. During the war, uh, one doctor, uh, Armenian doctor, uh, Ottoman Armenian, <coughs> reports that in Gallipoli, uh, he witnesses, and he gives this as a paper, there is no paper trace of it at all, except that somebody reports in a memoir, writes about here in this uh, uh, conference paper, uh, that the doctor witnesses some soldiers who suffer from uh, comptoformin, which is basically a, a forward flexion of the spine, because soldiers have to, artillery shells being fired around them, so they develop this form, and the stomach muscles tighten so hard that they can't straighten themselves out. So this becomes a permanent position of sorts. But numbers of these were not very high, and no numbers are actually reported. And that's basically the end of it. During the war, only a few case studies of uh, what we might call soldiers with shell shock symptoms are reported. And I will give you a couple of examples of those in a, in a few minutes. Besides that, though, we don't really see anything. And it is as if what Masar Osman said was true, because we don't find these case histories uh, being reported by, by the doctors uh, at all. Uh, but much like in the European armies, I mean, you know, historians tell us, and neuropsychiatrists at the time told us that why these symptoms developed was because these were fear reactions by soldiers to the conditions in which they had to fight. 
Well, if it's a fear reaction, and if it's done because they are always under constant threat of losing their lives, the sounds of artillery shells exploding, or artillery firing, etc., I mean, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, didn't the Ottomans face even bigger guns than <coughs> their enemies? I mean, they rained, as I say, uh, they, they, they received more shells per person, per square inch, than the Ottomans could fire on their enemies. So it just didn't make sense. Uh, I found some ways that uh, we could discover a few uh, cases, at least anyway, of, of uh, shell shock victims. What happens is that in 1919, when the war is over, Masar Osman starts to publish a medical journal. A number of articles appear in 1919. But a lot of these cases being reported are actually took place during the war. So they're sort of retrospective examination of what kinds of encounters they had with, with soldiers who displayed some of these conditions. Among them is, is uh, one of uh, Masar Osman's um, uh, former students uh, who says uh, basically that uh, we saw cases of hysteria during the war, but it was very difficult to distinguish hysteria from malingering or simulation of illness. In fact, this comes both from Germany and, and France. Uh, Charcot and Babinski had argued that there was really very little difference between hysteria and malingering uh, in the sense that they believe hysteria was unconscious malingering, and malingering obviously was conscious malingering, uh, which could get you in trouble and, have, and, and, and get you court-martialed, of course. Um, what uh, Shane Kanan says uh, in, in this article is that he gives us a case study of one soldier, Ottoman soldier, who had fought in Galicia, so in, in the Austrian front against, against the Russians. Uh, he suffered uh, no injury at all, no physical injury, but uh, he developed uh, symptoms of uh, paraplegia. He, he couldn't walk. Both of his uh, legs became paralyzed. Austria-Hungarian doctors could not help him after some months of treatment. They decide to send him to Istanbul, so it comes to his clinic, and he decides after examining uh, that this is a case of, well, either hysteria or malingering. Uh, in fact, at the end of the article, he still doesn't tell us. Uh, article's title is Hysteria According to Bobinsky. So what he does <coughs> in India is to grab the electrodes of the, what was called the Kaufman machine invented by Fritz Kaufmann, basically an electroshock machine, and decides that he's going to apply uh, electroshock therapy to the soldier's legs. Uh, whatever the symptom was, the electrodes were applied there. So if you could, if you were mute, you can imagine where the electro, uh, electrodes went. If you couldn't see to your eye, your tongue, etc., cetera, uh, whatever it was, if your arm was shaking, etc. So he, first session, he cures the soldier who could not walk. And soldier says, forget it, I'm, I'm well, uh, gets up and walks out. And meanwhile, he had to be brought in to the examination room uh, on a stretcher with the help of his friends. So for seeing Kenan, this is a difficult call. Difficult call in the sense that he doesn't say he didn't believe the soldier, but he definitely believes that this is least an unconscious malingering in the sense that it's hysteria, and using the electrodes of the Kaufman machine was enough to convince the soldier to give up on this kind of behavior. So electricity gave, produced willpower in the soldier, and this willpower allowed him to be cured and returned to his unit. They were no longer in Galicia at that point, so it was assigned uh, somewhere else. Now, having told you about the, our church degenerate article, I should uh, give you a couple of examples uh, from here. Uh, this is actually uh, from a British medical journal. So when the war started, uh, British doctors examining so, uh, reports, they, they, they decided basically they were going to get uh, allowed the most healthy looking and reject the rest. So initially, in 1914, these are the groups of men they allowed in that they rejected these uh, three groups. 
but won the war went on because they decided, you know, at first they thought they would come back by Christmas, and Christmas passed. Uh, so they moved to uh, grade two, grade three, and eventually to grade four. Uh, based on the physical uh, shape of the body, basically, physical morphology, they decided to grade these men according to healthy and various degrees of unhealthy. So somebody in the category of the three and four, and possibly even two, uh, would have been uh, graded as basically a, a degenerate. And what this meant goes back to 19th century, uh, Benedict Morel, a, a French uh, psychiatrist, who argued that uh, uh, partially due to civilization and modernity, uh, there had been a turn away from evolution, so a de-evolution of sorts. That certain groups, uh, either because of uh, what he called racial pollution, with, by which he meant uh, various races mixing together to create uh, uh, hybrid races, as it were, but at the same time, because of internal transgressions is what he called it. So alcoholism, for example, produced degeneracy. So if a father was alcoholic, he had uh, uh, um, offspring, and offspring would develop one or another form of degeneracy. And by the third uh, generation of this family, it would get so bad that uh, in the fourth generation, uh, the family would develop schizophrenia, after which would come complete sterile, individual would become sterile, and eventually, go extinct because they would not be able to procreate. So while it seemed dangerous, there was also hope from his perspective that they would destroy themselves. But by the end of the 19th century, some uh, British scientists, doctors, and in fact, uh, this idea, theory of degeneracy, <coughs> so widespread on the one hand and so undefined because everybody added something to it, that there was no easy way to define it. So some uh, British psychiatrist at the end had it that, no, they're not going to disappear. Uh, De-evolution is as possible as evolution itself. Therefore, these people constitute a threat to society because they also multiply, they said, very quickly. So there was this danger of uh, degenerates, basically, overtaking the uh, uh, healthy population. Uh, electroshock machine there and a cheat sheet, sheet for malingerers, basically, to tell. And in fact, in England, uh, uh, shops, doctors open sort of uh, alternative treatment shops where, where they would break your arm or leg so you would be exempted from military service. You could actually buy, um, um, a, a purchase the services of a doctor to be exempted from military service where the doctor would inject you with a disease, a common one was actually TB, and that sounds strange, but uh, this was this was uh, very common both in Turkey, not with doctors, and peasants did this themselves in, in Turkey, uh, but in England, doctors actually became involved, uh, pseudo-doctors maybe, in this kind of a thing. Um, shell shock victims, uh, here's a soldier in, in a British hospital with a strained cape, and he's barely able to walk. When he falls, it takes him such a long time to get up. Uh, Others simply could not hear, see, talk, etc. Uh, and, and these soldiers uh, obviously were uh, sidelined. They, they, they could not uh, go on uh, fighting. Now, coming back to Hussein Kenan's argument here. After he presents the case of this un unknown or anonymous soldier, I should say, from Galicia Front, Hussein Kenan reveals something. He says, well, during the war, and he doesn't, you know, none of them take it upon themselves to ever use the word I or we. Uh, they say passively that certain pronouncements were made where we, uh, you know, where it was argued that hysteria was not seen or not common among Ottoman soldiers during the war. He says we have to consider something. That it wasn't because it was not common, it was because a lot of cases of hysteria were deemed or judged to be malingering and therefore punished. So if you're diagnosing hysteria or hysterical symptoms with malingering, and therefore you know, hysteria is not going to exist in large numbers in the Ottoman army. Within a few years, Mahsar Osman also comes out with a few statements. Yes, we didn't see hysteria, but we saw hundreds, well, actually he says tens of thousands of cases of malingering. 
company calls them the army of malingerers. Um, and this is a very sort of a usual term, especially in, in German psychiatry. Army of psychopaths, army of malingerers, army of degenerates, etc. So Mas Erstmann uh, picks up on, on this and uses it in his everyday uh, terminology, basically. So this opens a window. Perhaps there were uh, soldiers with hysterical symptoms, but they were judged to be malingerers. Therefore, either they were court-martialed or punished or jailed or simply uh, treated with electroshock therapy and sent back to serve and finish their duties, basically. We still don't have any numbers. But if we look at uh, the cases of European armies, generally about 4% 4 of the um, permanent casualties, roughly equal to uh, the number of uh, soldiers who suffered from shell shock. So if we, in the army case, it's very difficult to figure out what the permanent casualties were. So I come up with the number of minimum about 50 to 60,000 possible cases of uh, shell shock in, in the, in the uh, army case. Now, in the war years, <coughs> other cases appear that takes us take us back to the um, take us back to the war years. Uh, I want to make sure I'm not talking too long here. I left my watch there. Um, what ends up happening is that we have two cases. I think they're instructive, and, and I want to talk about them uh, very briefly. One, I'll change here, is the case of this man, unnamed. Uh, he appears in a medical journal. Uh, he committed the crime of killing about half a dozen of his comrades in Gallipoli. Uh, when he's questioned, he says basically he had a dream uh, in this dream, a holy man told him that people who made guns, manufacturer of guns, I think the holy man was probably talking about Krupp rather than the, uh, uh, the soldier who was repairing malfunctioning guns, but being a simple peasant, he decided to take action and attack and kill some of his friends. And of course, he was apprehended, sent to a mental asylum where he was questioned, and, and basically he says, I, I had this dream, and the holy man told me to get rid of these people because I was tired of the bloodshed, the killing, and you know, uh, all, all this violence, etc. I mean, otherwise he sounds rational until up to the point of, of obviously committing this crime. Uh, and I decided that if I killed those people, the war would end, and I was only trying to stop the war. Right? He spends his, most of his life, or all of his life, in the mental asylum and eventually dies of uh, TB while he's uh, in the mental asylum. Now, he is diagnosed as, and I'm, I'm not making the case that this soldier was shell-shocked, but it's a possibility, right? He was diagnosed first as suffering from religious delirium, then later on the same doctor called him a degenerate schizophrenic. Now, I think cases like this hide in the background, even though they might occasionally, not always, I don't make the argument for this one, do not always point to uh, existence of shell shock or war neurosis, but it is possible this is what happened in this case. If you remember earlier on, I said doctors decided that hysteria or the hysterical symptoms seen, seen among the soldiers were no different than peacetime hysteria. So the argument follows <coughs> that if they're showing symptom, symptoms of peacetime hysteria, then it has nothing to do with the war. And something is wrong with these men in general. The war only created the condition for these pre-existing conditions to surface. So they were already hysterics, neurasthenics, degenerates, schizophrenics, or many other uh, uh, diseases they were diagnosed with at the time. So some of them, uh, you know, we, we have no uh, history on at all, actually, whether he acted strangely before or perhaps simply went insane because of the violence that he witnessed. But this makes it easier for the doctors, and I don't think they're doing this intentionally, it's this medical thinking, the thought process, to, uh, even if they have case studies, not to even bother the war experience of the soldier. So it comes here only because he killed his comrades in the <coughs> Otherwise, there is no mention of it at all. So, when war is divorced from the condition, then it's no longer shell shock. It's only pointing to shortcomings of an individual 
in this case, or many individuals when we look at the larger number. Another case comes up by, uh, in, 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 uh, during the war years in 1960-17, actually, that's when it's published, uh, of, of, a, uh, of an officer who I think was fighting in Gallipoli. His officer, high-ranking officer, his spirit refers this Zihni Afandi to, to Istanbul. He's examined in the military hospital and is given uh, the diagnosis of neurasthenia, given 20 days of leave, goes back, and comes back again. He's, he's treated, given <clears throat> 20 days of leave, goes back, comes back again. His officer, spirit officer, continually sending him back because he's not cured. Eventually, Zihni Afandi is sent to another hospital in Istanbul, La Pay, or Shishli Hospital, the French, uh, French hospital, which was taken by the Ottoman government during the war. And our doctor who examines Zihni Afandi says, this is not neurasthenia, this is schizophrenic. Again, he rarely refers to the sole officer's wartime experience, only to say his officer kept sending him back, we don't know what caused, I mean, he never says we don't know what caused it, because he assumes that he had this. But he finds it difficult to believe that such a person could go through training, education. He's an engineering officer, right? He went through rigorous schooling, etc. He just says, I don't understand why nobody would have noticed this before, because he's assuming it was always there. 